All right, so this is going to be cell structure and types. Um, we talked about the function of cells in lecture last week, so we're going to talk about the structure of the cells and what where the parts actually are inside of the cell. So most of this should sound familiar because we talked about function of pretty much everything we're going to go over today, last week. But we're going to start with the cell's plasma membrane. So the cell's plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, meaning it's two layers of phospholipids. So a phospholipid is a molecule with a phosphate head and a lipid tail. Okay, and remember, phosphates are hydrophilic and lipids are hydrophobic. Um, on either side of the cell, there is fluid. The cell has fluid inside, and that's called intracellular fluid. And then the cell has outside fluid called extracellular fluid. Both of these fluids contain water. Because the tails of the membrane are hydrophobic, when water is on the inside and the outside, it causes the tails to turn inward onto each other, so they're not really touching the water. So the bilayer is always going to be assembled with the phosphate head to the outside and the tail to the inside, because the tails are always going to be trying to get rid of or get away from that water. They don't like it. They're afraid of it. They hate it. Okay, and again, the cell's plasma membrane regulates what goes in and out of the cell based on what the cell needs. The plasma membrane is considered to be a fluid mosaic, and that just means that the proteins and the phospholipids inside that membrane are free to move. They're not stuck or like anchored. They can move around and glide, so it's always going to be moving and like wiggly. Um, and again, the tails are hydrophobic, so they turn inward to stay away from the water inside and outside of the cell, and that makes the phosphate heads go to the outside. So within this membrane, there are proteins and lipids. So um, integral proteins are one type of protein that can be in the cell membrane, and these are integral because they are integrated into the membrane. They're like stuck inside of it. Um, if you look at the picture, all these ones that are actually embedded in the membrane, like all the way through it, those are integral. Then there's transmembrane proteins. These are proteins that go through the membrane, in one, the, out, in one side and out the other side. Um, and there's a big blue swirly one here on this picture. Uh, peripheral proteins are the ones on the outside. And you can remember peripheral by thinking about what peripheral vision means. It means like to the side. So the peripheral proteins are the ones that are on the outside of the membrane, like stuck to one side. Glycoproteins are proteins that are attached to a sugar molecule. Um, and these are going to have a large protein attached with this little twig-like thing coming off of it, which is the sugar. And then there's a glycolipid. Glycolipid is a sugar and a fat. The lipids are going to be much smaller than the proteins, and they're going to have the same little stem-like thing coming off the top, which is the sugar. And in the pictures, you can see the glycoprotein is the really big one, and the protein looks like the other proteins in the picture. And the glycolipid is the one with the really small lipid molecule about the same size as the phosphate heads attached to it. So the glycocalyx, we talked about this last week. This is the fuzzy coat outside of the plasma, plasma membrane of the cell. So the fuzzy outer area of the, of the cell. Microvilli and cilia. So microvilli are the finger-like projections. These are used to increase surface area in certain cells, especially ones that are used for absorption, such as in the intestines. Um, the more surface area something has, the more it can absorb. So the main function is make more space so we can absorb more. And then the cilia, these are the hair-like projections. Um, the cells can use them for sensory, for movement. Every cell has one, some cells have many. And remember the non-modal ones that every cell has? Those are the ones that are used for sensory. Um, I remember cilia because of Mike Wazowski's girlfriend, cilia with the hair snakes. It's cilia is hair. And here's that non-modal cilia. Every cell is going to have one. They're immovable, and they're used as a sensory organ, kind of like an antenna. Um, it looks like those deep, dark ocean fish with the lights on their head, the angler fish. That's what it kind of looks like, like the one little antenna sticking out used to sense its environment because cells don't have eyes or hands. They use you know, the non-modal cilia to uh, find their way around. Um, and again, the base of the cilia is an axonomy, which is composed of a ring of nine pairs with two single rings in the middle. And we went over all this last week, the structure of the cilia, but here's another picture just to refresh 
what the inside of it would look like. Flagella and pseudopods. Remember, flagella is the tail, and these are only found on sperm in the human body. No, no other cells in our bodies have tails. It's essential to the function of being mobile, making it move quickly and easily. Um, it whips back and forth so it can swim really fast. And then the pseudopods are those temporary projections that a cell can grow to either grab things, attach to things, or move. And they can change. They're not permanent. They can grow one here. It can go back in and grow a new one. Those are those fake uh, fingers. That's why they're called pseudopods. So cytoskeleton and cytoplasm. The cytoskeleton, if you take that word and pull it apart, it directly translates to cell skeleton. So it's a skeleton of the cell. Um, it's made of microfilaments, which give the cell some support and structure, but it's not like bones. Okay, it's not really strong, but it does give it some support and structure and shape. Okay, and that's going to be inside the cell's um, cytoplasm. It's going to be like microtubules and microfilaments building up that skeleton. The cytoplasm is the jelly inside of the cell where all of the organelles or most of the organelles are anchored. Um, so looking at this picture, it's that purple area. It's like the gooey middle of the cell. So the center of our cell is our nucleus. And if you think about a cell, it looks like an avocado. Okay, It has a cell membrane, which would be the avocado skin. It has a cytoplasm, which would be the actual avocado part that we eat. And then it has a nucleus, which would be like the, the core, the pit of the avocado. So that's what the cell looks like. But inside that pit is another avocado type thing, the nucleus. So the nucleus is not just a solid like nucleus. It has parts, okay? It has the nuclear envelope, the nuclear pore, the nucleoplasm, and the nucleolus. So if we think about the nucleus like its own avocado, the nuclear envelope is the skin, the nucleoplasm is the avocado. Okay, so the cytoplasm and the nucleoplasm are very similar, except for the nucleo plasm is inside of the nucleus. The nucleolus is the nucleus of the nucleus. And then inside that nuclear envelope, there are nuclear pores. These are little openings that allow certain things to enter and exit the nucleus. And if we know what the function of the nucleus is, you can kind of think about what would be going in and out of it. Most of the time, it's going to be RNA going in to copy that code from the DNA. Okay, because we know that the nucleus holds the DNA. Right? It's where all the DNA is, and it's the control center of the cell. But it is made up of three specific parts, and it has pores. It's not just a solid core. The endoplasmic reticulum is located right outside of the nuclear envelope, so it's a continuation of the nucleus. Um, it doesn't hold DNA, though. It has a completely different job. And when we talked about protein synthesis, we talked about what this does. Um, the rough ER is the first one outside of the nucleus, and it's rough because it's studded with ribosomes. So it has ribosomes all over it. And it's because the rough ER modifies and folds proteins after they've been produced. So they're produced in the ribosomes, and then they go to the rough ER so they can fold them and package them. Um, outside of the rough ER, we have the smooth ER, and it's a continuation. It doesn't end and start a new like organelle. They flow into each other. It just stops having ribosomes. Okay, and the smooth ER is right past it. It looks very similar. It's just not studded. And that's where lipids are produced. So now we have all these little parts that are in the cytoplasm of the cell. We have ribosomes, lysosomes, and peroxisomes. So ribosomes, we've already talked about. These are the site of protein synthesis. And they are usually loose in the cytoplasm or they are on the rough ER. And it makes sense if you think about why they're on the rough ER, why they're so close to the nucleus. Because if the RNA has to come out of the nucleus with the genetic code, it would make sense that the ribosomes are right there because it doesn't have to travel far to find them. It's more efficient if it's closer. So the structure makes sense to the function. Uh, lysosomes, these are the little garbage men of the cell. And I remember them because they sound like Lysol. And lysosomes do the cleanup. They eat the waste. They get rid of the extra stuff. They get rid of the damaged stuff. They can even make the cell commit cell suicide if it's no longer functioning or if it's toxic or whatever is wrong with it and it needs to commit cell suicide, the lysosomes can initiate that. Um, peroxisomes are a version of lysosomes where they break down things like um, free radicals and toxins 
but they produce peroxide as a byproduct, which is why they're called peroxisomes. Um, when looking at the picture of a cell, a peroxisome has a darker middle than a lysosome. So it has a crystalline center. Um, so it's going to be darker on an image, and usually the lysosome's a little bit bigger. And then there's protosomes. These are also similar, but their function is to break down unneeded or damaged proteins. And when proteins become damaged and they no longer work, they're called denatured. So protosomes break down the denatured proteins or the extra ones that the cell does not need. So next we have the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is referred to as the powerhouse of the cell because it is where ATP production occurs. So when we make energy with our cells, it happens in the mitochondria. The mitochondria has a bunch of folds inside of it, which are called cristae. That's where the actual ATP production happens. And there are ribosomes inside of it. The mitochondria also has its own mitochondrial DNA because it can split and make more of itself if it needs if the cell needs to have more energy it can make more energy production sites so it has its own special mitochondrial DNA so the Golgi we've talked about the Golgi in the fact that when proteins are finished in the rough ER and they're finished being folded they're sent to the Golgi for packaging and inspection so the Golgi does that but it also makes carbs um, it looks like, to me, it looks like a splash water droplet type thing. It looks really wet and like flimsy. Um, it's usually not far from the endoplasmic reticulums and it has a lot of little vesicles around it. Um, usually attached to it, the little transport vesicles are usually really close to it or right outside of it. Um, because it needs to be able to package and transport those proteins to get them where they need to be used. So we briefly went over cell shapes in lecture, but let's hit on that a little bit more in detail. So again, we can have squamous, which are those flat scaly cells, um, cuboidal, which look like cubes, columnar, which are taller than they are wide, so they look like little columns, polygonal, these are weird shaped, typically like a polygon, stellate are the star shaped ones, spheroidal and discoidal, these ones are round, um, but the disc ones usually have like a pushed in center to make them look like a disc. Fusiform, these are the ones that are fat in the middle and skinnier at the ends. And then fibrous, these ones look like little threads. So here is the squamous ones, they're thin, flat, and scaly. They are usually found on the outermost layer of the skin and in the esophagus. And their, their skin, they're, they're found in the skin because they are very thin and scaly. They can take a lot of beating and they're always continuousing, continuously making more of themselves. So areas that take a lot of hits usually have squamous. Um, so your, your skin on the outside, you can hit it, bump it, rub it all day. And then your esophagus, if you think about what your esophagus does, you eat and swallow food. So it's always getting brushed by food. So these are the areas where you can find the squamous cells because they're flat. They can usually take a pretty good hit and be fine. And they're always continuously making more to replace the ones that get damaged. The, cubo the cuboidal ones are the square looking ones, and these are usually found in ducts and glands. And when you look at this picture, the big circle with the white in the middle is not a cell. That's like 20 cells. Okay, so if you look at the little purple dots, that's a nucleus. And you can see there's like a box around it. That is the cell, and that's why it's cuboidal, because it's very square. These cells are just making a duct or a gland, so they happen to make a circle when you put a bunch of them together. The columnar ones, these are usually basement membranes, so they're used to attach something to something else because it, they can stretch and they're longer. Um, if you look here in the picture, you can see they're long and skinny, and they all have a nice nucleus in the center. The stellate ones are the ones that look like stars, or I think that they look like some kind of alien creature um, with a bunch of limbs. These are normally nerve cells, when we talk about the nervous system, you'll see what I'm talking about when I say that they look like the alien creature. But um, they can also be found in the liver. Then the polygonal ones, these are polygon shaped and there are many places in your body. The round ones are usually blood cells. So the spheroidal ones and the discoidal ones, these are usually going to make up your blood cells. Um, and they're clearly going to be either round or disc shaped. It's really easy to um, differentiate between them. When the blood cells are not disc-shaped, there's usually a problem in carrying oxygen. 
So disk is the way that it should be. That's the, the most effective way. When they work the best, they're disk shaped. And then we have the fusiform and the fibrous. The fusiform are thick in the middle and thin at the ends. And these can be find, found in the cochlea of the ear. So the actual hearing organ. And then the fibrous ones are fiber-like. Their name is fibrous. They're fiber-like. These are usually in areas where they can be stretched from either direction. So when they're being pulled in two different directions. And these are usually, usually found in the dermis of the skin, which is the middle layer of the skin. So the top layer and the bottom layer of the skin are pulling on both sides of that dermis. And that's usually why um, it's fiber looking because it's being pulled both ways. The cells get stretched really far. And then we have cell arrangement. So cells can be either classified as simple stratified or pseudo stratified. And it just depends on how many cells there are. So when you have one single layer of cells not stacked on top of each other, just they're one layer deep, they are called simple. So it's just single layer. When they're stacked in two to 50, doesn't matter how many layers, when they're stacked, they're called stratified. As long as there's more than one, they're stratified. And then there are cells that can be pulled and tugged and they can look like they're stacked, but they're not really stacked. If you look at them, they only, there's only one cell that touches the bottom or the basement membrane. Those ones are pseudo stratified. And remember pseudo means like fake or make, made up, make believe. So pseudo stratified are like the fake stratified ones. They look stratified, but they're really simple. So those are simple stratified and pseudo stratified, a single layer, more than one layer, and ones that look like more than one layer, but they're not more than one layer. So all types of cells can be classified in these three classifications, depending on how many stacks or how many levels of cells there are.